Hello, everyone. Thank you for your interest in this talk. I'm Ratijit from Microsoft Gray Systems Lab. And today I will present about some microarchitecture analysis that we did for graph BI queries running on an RDPMS. So uh, this is uh, also joint work with Yuan Yuan, who is also from the Gray Systems Lab. We also presented this work earlier in the week at the Daemon workshop, which focuses on data management on new hardware. Sorry? Didn't that win an award that way? Yes, yes. You've got to write about yourself. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. Got that. So, as we all know, there are numerous applications for graph databases. This includes uh, fraud detection, social network analysis, financial crimes detection, uh, recommendation systems, planning, routing, and scheduling solutions, and so on. So one approach for handling graph workloads is to use native graph databases, such as DynaGraph, Neo4j, and other systems that are specialized for just graphs. A popular alternative is to use um, relational DBMS systems and run graph workloads on that. And that is the scenario that we are interested in this work. A lot of uh, earlier studies have also done performance evaluations and comparisons across different systems. But how well the underlying hardware is being utilized has not been well studied. So that is the focus of our work. But how is uh, understanding the hardware utilization useful? So for one, it can help us to get insights about performance bottlenecks on the current system. And also it can give us insights about how the efficiency could change uh, as hardware evolves. So looking at the hardware landscape, the hardware has been evolving. So here are some of the trends. So for the CPUs, uh, the per socket core count has been going up. So for example, today you can get AMD's Bergamo with 80 cores. And uh, going ahead, I believe Intel Sierra cores will have up to 144 cores. Uh, some CPUs are also getting high bandwidth memories. For example, the Mac CPU has a high bandwidth memory. Uh, cores are also becoming heterogeneous. You have different types of cores on a chip. There's interest in hardware specialization, for example, GPUs, FPGAs, and so on. So given this background, we were curious to understand how graph workloads running on RDBMS are utilizing the hardware. So in this work, we focus on CPU servers. And we are also interested in getting some insights about what capabilities we want to see in new backends so that these, hard, these workloads could run more efficiently. So for this study, we use the social network benchmark and uh, focusing on the BI workload. So as Gabor uh, presented earlier in the session, this is a very interesting benchmark and it models people interacting through various social forums. People can also create friends by knowing other people. So we implemented this uh, database in, um, as an in-memory database in DuckDB. We use plain SQL. And DuckDB is running inside a Pyro 5 server process. So this graph has both uh, directed and undirected edges. So the undirected edges are, are for the person versus person relation. And so we implement both the vertices and edges of equal tables. For the undirected edges, we swap the columns and do an union with the original values. We look at the 20 uh, read queries for the BI workload and their variance. So the variance are based on differences in the properties of the query parameters. So we don't have a full implementation uh, for the queries. Uh, so one of the challenges we faced um, was how to efficiently do shortest path computations. And uh, so to keep um, the run times and memory consumptions within reasonable limits, we specify limits uh, on those maximum path lengths. So that's different from uh, the spec uh, for the queries. And uh, so we are using uh, repeated joins as well as um, recursive CTs uh, for the implementations. For this study, we used a uh, dual socket uh, Cascade Lake CPU server. It has 16 physical cores per socket. Uh, so for two sockets, you have 32 physical cores. We turn on hyperthreading, so it has 64 logical cores, and uh, the total memory is 750 GB. So for CL factor 100, the peak memory residence size uh, was about 250 GB by running the workload. So the first analysis we looked at was how well are the logical cores uh, being utilized and how efficiently the instructions are getting executed. 
This chart shows some metrics. So the logical core utilization, so that's shown in the dark bars and corresponds to the left vertical axis. So this is the number that you would see by running top when the queries are running. And these metrics are averaged over the entire run of the query. So you see for a number of queries, uh, we get um, high utilization, so 80% or more. But there are a number of queries which have uh, more moderate utilization. So looking ahead, as we increase the port counts, it will be important to increase the utilization. Otherwise, there can be a lot of compute resources that are underutilized. The IPC stands for instructions per cycle, and it measures how efficiently the instructions are executed. So this is shown in the light bars and corresponds to the right vertical axis. So usually an IPC of less than one is considered low. And here we see for most of the queries, the IPC is less than 0.75. And for some queries, it was even less than 0.25. So this suggests that there are some inefficiencies causing performance bottlenecks. What size of the SMB was it? So this is a factor 100. Yeah. So uh, the, this uh, low IPC it suggests that there are some inefficiencies causing performance bottlenecks and. Uh, by addressing those inefficiencies, there is potential room for performance improvements. So to understand more about the inefficiencies, we looked at how well the core pipeline slots are being utilized. So here we should see a distribution. So the retiring category means that the instructions are getting completed and retired. So this represents useful work. Front-end bound means that the pipeline slots are waiting for instructions to be fetched, decoded, and issued. Bad speculation means pipeline slots are being wasted uh, due to misspeculation, such as incorrect branch predictions. Memory bound means that the pipeline slots are waiting for memory operations to complete, and this includes operations uh, to both the cache hierarchy as well as to data. Core bound means that the pipeline slots are waiting for core computations to complete. So across the queries, we see that a majority of the pipeline slots were waiting either for instructions to be fetched and issued or for memory operations to be completed. The core bound slots are also not very high. So for new backends, uh, what you would like to see is a more efficient instruction delivery and memory access. We could perhaps uh, do with uh, weaker cores due to the smaller percentage of the core bound category. Next, we drill deeper into the memory bound category and we looked at stall cycles caused by loads at different levels of the memory hierarchy. So here, L1 bound, L2 bound, L3 bound, and DRAM bound means stalls are caused by loads to that level of the memory hierarchy. Now, of course, we expected to see DRAM stalls, but we are also seeing the on-chip cache hierarchy causing bottlenecks. And so looking forward, we as we see more and more uh, external memory bandwidth, say for example, with high memory bandwidth in CPUs, the on-chip can still cause performance bottlenecks. So it's important to address that. So more efficient cache hierarchy designs or uh, perhaps more uh, cache conflicts query pricing could help with that. For DRAM bound queries, we found more stock cycles uh, due to latency, memory latency, rather than approaching bandwidth limits on this platform. So techniques uh, such as uh, Software prefetching could perhaps help to reduce that. For a number of uh, queries, we also saw a high percentage of uh, NUMA memory accesses. So NUMA is non-uniform memory access, and this happens when uh, uh, the memory on the other socket is accessed. And the latency shows up by more than 50% for NUMA accesses, and the bandwidth is also less. So NUMA aware data plus placement and scheduling could help with that. I'm sorry, very briefly. Yeah. Thread migration. No. So, so thread migration. No right, water. right. That would certainly help. Yeah. So, so far we looked at uh, cache hierarchy and uh, memory, but how well are the TLBs performing? So, the TLBs are hardware structures that cache the translation from virtual address to physical address, and these are essential for supporting virtual memory. The TLB, TLBs are also have limited number of entries, and during address translation, if an entry is not found, then a page walk can happen, and this can take more than 100 cycles. So this is a very costly operation. So the question we wanted to ask is, could huge pages reduce these TLB overheads and improve performance? 
So a quick way to try this out was to use the transparent huge pages capability in Linux. So with this capability, the kernel will automatically try to allocate two megabyte pages instead of the default four KB pages whenever possible. So the decision is up to the kernel. So with this, we saw some significant improvements for some queries. And for some queries, we saw it was more than 50%. So for the full workload, that is just considering the sum of the query times, the workload speed up was 23%. So summarizing, um, in this work, we did a microarchitectural analysis of a graph BI workload running on an RDBMS. We found that the code resources were underutilized, the pipeline slots were underutilized, the IPC was low, and there are bottlenecks in both off-chip as well as on-chip uh, accesses. TLB overheads could be reduced by huge pages, and so more uh, TLB conscious query processing could help there. We have additional results um, in our daemon paper, for example, more results on uh, data balance utilization and with another scale factor as well. For new packets, uh, we would like to see more efficient instruction delivery and data access, as well as uh, large memory capacity. Perhaps we could do with weaker cores. So we believe that microarchitectural analysis can be used as a complementary technique to algorithmic analysis and uh, improvement in query processing algorithms such as worst case optimal joins and factorized query execution, or software analysis and improvements such as uh, supporting recursive CTEs more efficiently. So microarchitectural analysis can give us insights about system bottlenecks and what we would like to see in future hardware. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the talk. I have a quick question. So I find in the performance analysis that there's a lot of instability if I just repeat benchmark run and run and run without changing anything. And um, <clears throat> I've gotten into bad habit of trying to fix that, uh, acting like a real scientist and reporting error bars on all my numbers by running this multiple times. Did you find your results stable? Did you look for that effect? I mean, yes, so did you find the results stable? Right, so we ran the query for 30 settings of parameter values. So it's like the same query being run 30 times, but with different values of the parameters. And depending on those values, your uh, runtime and utilization can change. So the numbers that we presented here are the average of those 30 runs. Uh, but you didn't show statistical variation, uh, standard deviation. Now, that, that's correct. So I think it, it, it was not very large uh, for the system because we had enough memory and enough cores. So, yeah. Yeah, I will go and the microphone to Peter. Thanks for thanks for the nice uh, working talk. Hey, I asked uh, before uh, yeah, what size it was running on uh, because well, I'm. Um, of course, it's interesting to see, but um, I'm, I'm a little surprised that there are many uh, cache spaces because you're doing graph processing, so what's new with this room? Um, but um, about the utilization, that was not so high in WP, of course, we care about that. Yeah, uh, so that's uh, so, so yeah. my question is so, uh, did you try to run also larger sizes? Because WP has a relatively large. Um, more total size, 120,000 elements um, per core. So in order to even to start to get parallels, you have to have millions of tuples. I'm not sure exactly how many tuples there are, how many persons there are in this query. So maybe if you have more, you get more morsels and you get more core utilization. So that you try also a bigger scale factor. So we tried two scale factors, uh, 10 and 100, and certainly when we went up to 100, the utilization increased. So it's possible that uh, going to even larger sizes could uh, increase that. Uh, so one of the limitations we faced was that uh, because of the shortest path computation that was using up lots of memory, we were doing repeated joins. So on this machine, that like going to even larger data sets, it could, it could be difficult with the memory we had. And now for the utilization, there were certainly phases during the query execution when all the cores are getting used. So this is the end to end. Like, uh, uh, from start to end, when we average out the utilization, these are the numbers you see. So there could be certain choke points in the query, perhaps when it's gathering the results and it's not using all the cores. No, this is, uh, no, we haven't reduced the implementation. So the query uh, specifications, so we, 
reuse a lot of those uh, implementations from the AMRA reference implementation. We read out a few of the ways, uh, particularly those considering the person knows person um, relationship. That's AMRA. So we implemented those.